We're having a blood blood donor drive this Friday, bo bone marrow, bone marrow drive this Friday, and it's from it's at Nord, room 310, from 10 a.m. to 4:30 a.m. 4:30 p.m. 4:30 p.m. 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 <laughs> and it's actually extra credit for chem, and everybody thinks that it hurts, but it doesn't. They don't do the surgery process anymore. They do a completely different process, and it's supposed to be like virtually painless. So extra credit. It's just this cotton swab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now it's not going to take any long, maybe waiting time, but maybe 10 minutes. So please come. We need you guys. Okay? Thank you. The only time that it hurts is if they ask you to actually donate. <laughs> no. Talk to Matt. If you are found as a match, then they need to take a sample of your marrow. That hurts. So, but to, to register for the, to sign up for the registry, it's just a, cotton swab in your cheek, three of them, they put it in an envelope and they ship it off. So it's a piece of cake. This is a bonus opportunity, although as I said the last time, if you are at all thinking that you might say no, should they call you and say we'd like you to, you have been found as a match, please don't waste their time or yours. Um, it, is, uh, it is potentially painful, right Matt? He's looking forward to it. Do you want to do that one first? No, you can go. Well, yeah, I'll do that one next. I'll do the Shavuot. How do I? Shavuot. Shavuot? Shavuot. Shavuot. You can tell the Gentile here doesn't know what he's talking about. There is a cheesecake party. That's what's important, right? A Shavuot party on Monday night in the Red Rider Room, Rough Rider Room. Uh, free cheesecake, all you can eat. And it is a bonus opportunity. Not only do you get a bonus point if you show up, you get cheesecake. So uh, last year we, uh, I think the entire class showed up for a slice of cheesecake. Um, and they asked me if I would make it a bonus opportunity again. I said, sure, what the heck. So you can go get a study break Monday night, get some cheesecake and get a bonus point. So I do not need a reflection. I don't want to know how good the cheesecake was. All right, next thing are SI sessions. So Fine. tonight, Wednesday, our last big Wednesday session. So we're planning on going over the new material and also um, we have all the old exams with answer keys. So whether it's exam one, exam three, whatever you guys want to go, go over, we'll also be um, fielding any questions you have. So tonight, big Wednesday exam review. And Sunday is the Chem Fiesta. So this Sunday is the Chem Fiesta. The time is kind of up for debate. Up for debate. So we had it planned for one to six, but apparently there's the big A grace thing on the field, which you should do because you can win a huge plasma TV. Um, that starts at four. So we're proposing maybe we could do ten to four. You might be able to leave a little early instead of one to six. So we're gonna take a vote. If you want one to six, raise your hands. Oh, Jess, can you count? Well, I mean, <laughs> can you count them, please? <laughs> Keep your hands up high, please. So, one to six. 32. Dr. Kenny said 32. You're slow. All right, now if you want... I haven't counted. I'm 28, not bad. All right, if you want 10 to four, raise your hands. Oh. Wow, it's close. Crap. No, that's 47. Okay, so it appears that we're going to do 10 to 4, right? Are we sure about the room? No, we're not sure about the room, but we'll know Friday if we're sure about the room. Okay, on Friday we'll confirm 10 to 4, but the Chem Fiesta will be on Sunday. Um, today I will email out the specified schedule of this topic for this many minutes, when you have breaks, all that. Um, we're talking to the department about what type of money we can get, um, and we'll try and provide some sort of food. So, Chem Fiesta on Sunday, don't forget, we'll verify the time and schedule on Friday. Taylor. Oh, Taylor. <laughs> Two quick announcements. Uh, one's from the dean. Uh, hopefully you got a survey in your, in your inbox for your email. It's your uh, first year survey. It's really important you fill that out. Dean Amon really urges all first years to complete it, and it helps in making decisions. Second is... The Hudson Relays are this Saturday at 10.30, and if you're not on the team, we urge you to come support us, because if we win four years in a row, we all get a steak dinner, if you ran. But uh, anyway, thank you for uh, trying out if you did, if you got bonus points. Uh, that'll be emailed to Dr. Kenny soon, but again, it's bonus points if you come and support the team and check in. 
So uh, just uh, let me know if you plan on doing that. Thanks. You're going Friday? The meeting? Yeah, I'll be there. I can't make it. I got another meeting. Yeah. Uh, in regards to the survey, um, I happen to be one of the pers uh, persons on the first year cohort committee. Um, and that survey is to enable the committee to take evaluation of what's going on with regard to first year students at Case. Um, it is something that uh, is very helpful to us, so please take a few minutes. No, it is not a bonus opportunity. Let me repeat that. It is not a bonus opportunity, because if I did, then we couldn't do the survey. So um, there's nothing to be gained for you from this other than participation, and there is a drawing for prizes if you complete it, so uh, there are some good things. Saturday is Spring Fest and the Hudson Relays. The Hudson Relays start at 10.30, right? All right. Uh, they start out at the Rock in front of Adelbert. They finish at the Rock in front of Adelbert. Uh, definitely come on out and cheer on the team somewhere along the course. Uh, the, your class has a little competition in the second and third year classes, so um, I will be there. Also come to Spring Fest. There's rumors that there is going to be target practice using Diet Coke and Mentos in some instructor who teaches a large intro chemistry class. I don't know who that would be, but um, pot shots are going to be allowed. Uh, so check that out. Uh, Sunday's the fiesta. Uh, your final exam's a week from tomorrow, right? In case you forgot. Uh, yes, I am still working on those, yes, the papers. We won't qualify what kind of papers. I am shooting to, like I said, where's Alex so he can hassle me. Have them, there you are, have them ready, for, scores ready for you Friday so that you can make that conscious decision. How do you set this darn thing up? I don't know. I had a nice picture of the front row here. There it's focus, anyway. Um, so I will have those for you Friday so you can make that decision. Now, let me try to do this one last time as clearly as I always do. All you have to do is add up your points. Don't think percentages. Your grade is based on points. 630 points and up is an A, 560 points and up is a B, 455 points and up is a, is a guaranteed C. All you got to do is add up the points. If you choose to not take the final, it just means You've only got a possible maximum number of points of 650, but you can still get 630, right? So you can still get an A. Um, so all, if you just count up all your points, when you go to figure out, should I take the final exam or not, um, that's when you sit and say, okay, if I throw out this score, how many points do I need on the final? Somebody came into my office and said, okay, if my low score is a 72 and I get a 70 on the final exam, what'll happen? Well, I'll throw out the 70. You'll still have 72 points. Um, if you, you need to, so just add up points. That's the easiest thing to do. Don't think percentages, which is why I've been saying that all semester. All right, questions? Yes? I, well, I'd like to give the final exam to my secretary on Tuesday. So I need your questions for the final exam no later than Monday. And that doesn't mean when you go to bed after you wake up, whenever, what, what I'm trying to say is if you don't go to bed till 3 in the morning Tuesday, that's too late. I'd like it Monday so I can write the test at a reasonable time of day. I'm still planning to do it based on questions. Obviously, if there's not enough questions up there, I won't do that. I haven't looked. Are there any questions up there? Did Emma put one up there. Remember, putting one up there is worth a bonus point. The other thing is, you should comment on people's questions. You should ask them, is this the way to do this problem? Start a, so start asking each other questions about how to do them, and that's to your advantage. One, just one. So write one very good question. And as I said, I reserve the right to say this question is not bonus point worthy. So. You do have to earn it. You can't just say, what is the atomic mass of calcium carbonate? Hopefully you can all do that, I would assume. All right, other questions? All right, uh, let's see, crystal field theory.
I am. Just push all the buttons, eventually one works. As I started to do this, earlier, I, I, I realized I need to, to, I need to fill in a gap of something that I skipped. And we have actually talked about it off and on a couple of times. The gap is, why do certain compounds appear to us to have certain colors? What is it about the interaction of light and matter? Let's go all the way back for a second to when that we first introduced quantum numbers. The first quantum number, the principal quantum number, the n quantum number, came from Niels Bohr's model of the atom. And part of the reason I skipped Niels Bohr model of the atom is because we spend all this time in the textbook talking about how this teacher, and they describe him as a high school teacher, but he was a teacher came up with this theory for how electrons orbit around the nucleus, and, and then he sh they show the experiment, which we're going to talk about, about the interaction of light and matter. And then when all is said and done, and you spend about three sections of the chapter talking about it, then the, the punchline is, oh, and by the way, he was wrong. The Bohr model of the atom is a very simple model that many of you have learned, and some of you still may believe it, that said that there are electron, there are orbits around the nucleus where you can find electrons. The electrons are somewhere in an orbit, the planetary model, that says the, the nucleus is the center of the solar system and the electrons are the planets that orbit it. And what Bohr said was if I somehow put energy into an atom and I take electrons from their lowest energy state and raise them to another, to a higher energy state, they will fall back down, and in the process of losing, uh, falling down from a high energy state to a low, they have to lose energy. They can either lose that energy in the form of heat, because they've collided with something, or they can lose that energy in the form of light. And what Bohr proposed that was truly revolutionary is he said the light was quantized which means there are only certain allowed energy levels. And he equated those to those rings around the, the nucleus of the atom. So what Bohr then said was, okay, I'm just going to make this simple. We'll call this first ring one, the second ring two, three, and so on. And the success of the Bohr model was based on one phenomenal set of experiments. He took hydrogen gas, put enough energy into it to break it into hydrogen atoms, and then put enough additional energy into it to, it to move the 1s electrons, which we now know are there, up to higher energy states. And then as those electrons fell back down, giving off energy in the process, he looked for the emission of light. And what he saw, which made no sense at the time, was something that looked like that. In other words, on a dark background, he saw discrete lines corresponding to different colors. And those discrete lines, when he sat and said, okay, I'm gonna do some mathematical manipulations and see if this makes sense, what he was able to show is that he could describe each one of these lines in terms of a transition from n equals 3 to n equals 2. That would be one line. Another transition was n equals 4 to n equals 2. He saw n equals 5 to 2, 6 to 2, 7 to 2. He saw 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 lines corresponding to those five transitions. And what he said was, there's, we can only have an electron sitting at a specific energy level, and it can't be anywhere in between. It's either here or here, and it can't be in between. That was revolutionary. And everybody was all, hey, this is great, we love it, let's do it for helium. Boom, it tanks, like you wouldn't believe. As soon as you put a second electron in, that second electron screws everything up. If I take these fluorescent lights right now, 
and I were to disperse the light into its spectrum, what I would see is something that looks like this. I would see, just like a prism, the light dispersing into the entire spectrum. But what I'd also see is a couple of bright lines, a green one and a yellow one. Oops, wrong way. A yellow one and a green one. Because each one of those fluorescent light bulbs has mercury in them. And mercury, like every other element on the periodic table, exhibits a line spectrum like Bohr saw. And, uh, and spectro people who had studied light already knew this was true. They always wondered, why are there those couple of bright lines in that white light distribution, a couple of very bright lines? And so when Bohr was able to show that he could get line spectra from a monatomic gas, they said, maybe that's what it is. And so there was high hopes that we could explain this. The problem is, where's mercury? What tomatometer is, who's got their periodic table with them? Mercury. Know it off the top of your head? I can never remember. Where's my periodic table? It's in my wallet, believe it or not. Let's say at the top, oh, there's one in the calculator. It's like atomic number 82. You know what you said, 82? That's bismuth. No, what I said, 80. I said 49. 49. All right, so mercury's atomic number 80, so it's got 80 electrons, and so it's 1s2, 2s2, 2s3, uh, whatever. It's got a lot of electrons. And the line spectra that we would expect to get from it corresponds to the separation energy between them. So it'd be great if we could calculate it. Well, what happens if you take something like some fun molecule like that, which you'll learn more about next semester or next year in organics. In this molecule, we talked about molecular orbitals. Well, we can look at the molecular orbitals of this molecule and we can say, okay, there's a series of Remember this, sigma and pi orbitals? Sigma being single bonding orders, pi orbitals being the double bonding orbitals. Well, you can do the same thing in this that, that Bohr did, is we can start to put electrons into these. And then we can promote electrons from a low energy state to a higher energy state. And once they get up to that higher energy state, they will relax down to a lower energy state, and in the process of relaxing, they either give off light or heat. The nice thing about these big organic molecules, remember, this is just energy on this axis. And this is true for any molecule, actually. The change in energy between any two energy levels is related to the wavelength. And if that energy is of the right magnitude, The light that you see may be visible. Actually, is that, is that a contradiction? It may uh, correspond to an energy that occurs in the visible region of the spectrum. The nice thing about that five benzene combination there is that it will give off light in the visible region of the spectrum. That will look red to you because it absorbs light in the visible region of the spectrum. So as it absorbs energy, promotes electrons to a higher energy state, they fall back down, you're going to be able to see the colors. Now, where does that fit with what we're talking about now? If you look at the 3D atomic orbitals, the transition metals, 
and you start putting electrons into those transition metals. What you can find out is that if you assume they're all at the same energy, not a lot happens. It's kind of boring. But if you start to change the electrical nature of the atom, so I take a copper atom and I surround it with six water molecules. Now each of those water molecules is going to have an impact on those 5D orbitals. And because of the geometry of the way they're arranged, those two orbitals right on the axis system will interact differently with those six water molecules than will the other three orbitals which are between the axis systems. We defined this one the other day as the dx squared minus y squared orbital that one being the dz squared orbital. And there are three of these. The dxy, dxz, and dyz, depending upon which two axes it's between. In, a, in the octahedral arrangement, such as that one, what's going to happen is those three orbitals will interact less strongly with these molecules than will these two. And so this arrangement gets split. So these are now the dxz dyz and dxy orbitals. And the other two orbitals will be pushed up in energy and now we use the rules that we talked about about putting electrons in. Hund's rule said you put electrons into orbitals that are the same energy before you pair them up and so if we have five electrons to put in here you get that arrangement. Okay? So far everybody okay? A lot of stuff in a hurry. Ultimately, I just wanted to get to this because now what happens? Now when I shine light on this, I can move one of these electrons from this lower energy state to this higher energy state. Once it's up here, it can fall back down and when it falls down, it does so giving off heat or giving off light. And because of the energy separation between those orbitals, it's the right size that we can see that color. Good question. Why does it just do the D shell? The answer is it doesn't do just the D shell. Do you remember when we first did electron configurations? We had to justify why we filled the 4s orbitals before the 3d orbitals. And so we used the argument saying, the 1s orbital is down here, it's the lowest in energy. The 2s is a little higher in energy. The 2p are even higher in energy than the 2s, but the 2p orbitals are at a similar energy. The 3s is here. The 
The 3P is a little higher in energy and the 3D is even higher yet. The 4S, depending upon whether there are electrons in the 3D or not, is going to be either a little higher or a little lower in energy than the 3Ds. When there are no electrons in the 3Ds, it's a little bit lower in energy, and so you fill the 4S orbital before the 3D. After you start to put electrons into it, they'll shift position, which is why when you ionize them, you might take them from different places. So now, when I start to pair up the electrons, when I start to get splitting of the orbitals, now I've truly separated the 3D from the 4S. Some of them will be lower in energy and some will be higher. Remember, those two are probably still there. So now when I pump energy into this thing, I'm going to promote electrons to higher energy states. They might go here, they might go here, they might go to the 5P or the, or the, um, the 4D. They could go lots of the 4P, they could go to lots of different places. The only ones that we can visibly see, the only ones that have an energy separation in the visible region of the spectrum, are the between the d orbitals. If they go to a different n quantum number, the energy separation is too great, you can't see it. If this energy separation is too great, is the wavelength high or low? If this gets bigger, that one has to get smaller. So you go to more in the ultraviolet. Take an aside here, come back to this one for a second. All of the transitions that Bohr saw, all of the colors that he saw were in the visible region of the spectrum. They all ended at n equals two. There's nothing that says you can't have transitions to n equals one. What region of the spectrum do you think those transitions appear? I'm sorry? Direction. Wrong direction. In the, In the ultraviolet. Because you've increased the energy sub. Now we're going from n equals 3 to n equals 1 compared to n equals 2. If n equals 3 to n equals 2 was visible, n equals 3 to n equals 1 is greater energy, shorter wavelength, it shows up in the ultraviolet. And so Bohr predicted that there was another set of lines that, he, that you, he couldn't find because his eyes could not see it. And sure enough, when they could start to see ultraviolet, they found them. What about transitions that end equal at n equals three? Well, those are gonna be at even longer wavelengths because the energy separation is smaller. And so those appear in the infrared. And those two he couldn't see because he had no way to detect them. But as soon as they could see things in the, ultra, in the infrared, they found those transitions. For our transitions with transition metals, this energy separation between the d orbitals corresponds to a visible color spectrum. And if the energy separation goes to a different n quantum number, it gets to be too large an energy separation, the wavelength is too short, it's outside of the visual, visible region, it's somewhere in the ultraviolet. So it does happen, we just can't see it. Right now, you are all being bombarded by radio waves. And I know because I've heard your cell phones go off. I mean, if we weren't being bombarded by radio waves, there's no way your cell phone could be getting a signal right now. There's no way you could be using your wireless internet to watch house or whatever else. So why do those electromagnetic radiation not impact you in any way? Why don't you feel them? Are they low energy or are they high energy? If they're radio waves, they're very long wavelength. Very long wavelength is very low energy, but more importantly, we don't have energy levels at that energy separation to absorb that light or that electromagnetic radiation. So we don't sense it. If there was an energy separation that corresponded to that, we would absorb it. Why don't you feel high energy ones for exactly the same reason? One of the things that 
you can do with this now I want to go back to that one for a second. Microwaves. When microwaves first come out, came out, everybody was concerned because they said, what happens if they leak? They leak radiation. Radiation was a four-letter word. Everybody said, oh, we're going to have x-rays showing up on the side of the kitchen wall. Okay. X-rays are completely different than microwaves. Hopefully you all know that. Microwaves work because they, they function at a very specific wavelength that corresponds to a very specific energy transition in water molecules. That energy transition takes a water molecule and starts it to rotate. It's been like this. And when it starts to rotate, if it's not spinning on a perfectly um, symmetrical axis, it will wobble. It will run into other water molecules. Those, that collision will cause friction. Friction generates heat. The heat then heats up the food. So food that doesn't have water in it can't be heated in a microwave. You have to have water in whatever it is you're doing. What's the difference between a microwave safe plate and one that's not? How much water is in it? If it has water in it, it's not microwave safe. You pull it out and you will burn your hands because it too has heated up. The radiation that's in there, the frequency corresponds to this energy transition. Now it ends up that water with three atoms we talked about this hit in PCHEM has nine energy transitions that it can absorb energy at. The number of, in PCHEM we call them degrees of freedom. I'm just going to call them energy transitions because that's really what they are. You multiply the number of atoms times three to find out how many different energy transitions there are. So in a monatomic atom there are three of them. So hydrogen has three different energy transitions. They correspond to moving the atom along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So you can translate the molecule or the atom in three dimensions. Okay? I can also get it to start vibrating, but I can't get a monatomic atom to vibrate. So if I take a hydrogen molecule, It has six energy transitions. Everything has the three translations. In a water molecule, the other two, ro t two energy transitions are to start the molecule rotating and start it to vibrate. So what do they look like? Well, a water molecule can translate along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. Those are its three translations. Those are pretty low energy transitions. They're pretty easy to go. We cannot measure those transitions. They're too close together. Everything's going to be this quantized energy level. The vibration's pretty obvious. The water molecule starts to vibrate like this. It's called a symmetric vibration because as one hydrogen atom is going out, the other one's going out as they both come back in. So it's symmetrical. They're both doing the same thing. I could not get an asymmetric vibration. An asymmetric vibration would be one where one atom is moving out from the center and the other one is moving in towards the center because as soon as I do that, it's a translation. Okay? If a water molecule starts vibrating, so one atom moves one direction, and the other one moves the same direction, it becomes just a translation, so it's the same thing. So it can vibrate, and then it can also rotate. Here's my water molecule. I can rotate it like this, and I can rotate it like this, 
but I can't rotate it like this and see anything. Nothing changes. The center of mass stays there, but it doesn't look like anything's happening. So you can't tell whether I'm doing it or not unless you're watching something that's changing on here. Okay, so it has the two rotations, the hydrogen molecule. Now look at water. He has three translations. The only other two types of motion we're going to talk about are rotations and vibrations. And so we have to think about that water molecule. How many different rotations can we envision? Well, again, if I grab it around the center and I start rotating it like this, that's one rotation. That's along that vertical axis, horizontal axis. If I grab it along this axis now, and I take it, the two hydrogens spinning like this, with the oxygen atom staying right on the axis, that's a rotation. There are two different rotations. It takes a lot less energy to grab this thing in the center and start spinning it like this than it does to spin it around like this. Okay? They're similar, but in one case, the, two hi the, the atoms are moving counter to each other, the other one they're moving together. So they'll have different energies associated with them. The third one is just like the second one around a different axis, except now I'm going to take the two hydrogens and I'm going to spin it this way. Both hydrogen atoms moving in the same clockwise direction. So there are three rotations. There's a total of nine. So how many vibrations do there have to be? Three. Your challenge is to find them. Well, one is symmetrical. By symmetrical, the two hydrogens are both stretching out and coming back in along the bond. That's a symmetrical vibration. The hydrogen atoms are doing the same thing at the same time. What if one goes down and one goes up? It would enter and it would become a rotation. If that were to happen, the molecule would start to rotate around. So that's not one. Or is it? What if you got one to stay stationary? There's something called a wag. So it's flapping its wings like this, the hydrogen atoms. If you imagine that those bonds are like a spring, it starts to flap its wings. The last one, let's see, symmetrical. There is, there, any, there is an asymmetrical that doesn't enter into a rotation. One of them, a hydrogen atom goes out while the other one comes up. That one won't rotate. The, that one will just sit and vibrate back and forth. The reason why I show you this is now let's take something simple. Calcium carbonate. It has one, two, five atoms. It has, therefore, five times three. Fifteen different energy transitions. Three of them are translational. I'll tell you that three of them are rotational, and the other nine are vibrations. If I go to everybody's favorite organic molecule, did I draw that right? Aspirin. I think that's aspirin. Did acetosalis to look acid? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen atoms, fifteen, sixteen, so eighteen atoms.
54 energy transitions. Three of them are translations, three of them are rotations, and the other 48 are different vibrations of that molecule. What does that do for that simple spectrum that Bohr first showed us? Now we don't have those individual lines showing up anymore. Now we've got 54 different energy levels that there can be 54 different energy transitions that can happen at different places. And so you start to get spectra that aren't lines anymore. They start to look like And this is your taste of uh, organic spectroscopy for next year. You're going to start to learn to interpret spectra that look amazingly like that. And being able to use those, so is that the fun part you're doing now? When did you do IR? I'm done with OCHEM. You're done with OCHEM. Oh, Jeff says, I'm out of it. Forget it. Um, and all of these come back to those energy levels we talked about. Every single transition, every time you see a colored compound, it's because there is an electron, a transition from one energy state to another where you get absorb light and then give up the light. And as long as that happens, you'll be able to, do, be able to measure something about the molecule. Now, I'm sorry? They have machines to do it. Yeah, you're not going to have to do it with your eyes. You can do it with the machines. But, the, you, but then understanding what the machine gives. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to save this for Friday. So, um, On Friday, what I'm going to do is bring in different ways to change this using the different things that are attached. So we're going to take some copper and put water on it and put chlorine on it and see what happens to the color and try and figure out. The other thing I want you to think about is compare those 5D electrons that are in the top of the board. Here, with that arrangement, and the question I'll ask you Friday is, which one's going to be more affected by a magnetic field? I'll see you Friday.